Greetings and welcome to a LGR Woodgrain 46 upgrade thing. And today we've got the Intel Pentium Overdrive processor. Makes your Intel 46 processor based PCs run faster, which is great because that's what I want to do. Yeah, we're going to take the Woodgrain 46's uh, AMD AM46 CPU that's in there, running at 66 megahertz, and turn it into a Pentium of sorts. <laughs> it's kind of a weird thing. You know, it takes a, a 46 and makes it an 83 megahertz Pentium. Yeah, a bit of an odd frequency rating there, but that's what Intel was doing, man. In the mid 90s, they had all sorts of interesting overdrive chips, and this one in particular just attracted me to it. Yeah, the POD P5 V83, <laughs> you know, because of the weird rating, 83 megahertz, and I've just never messed with one of these Pentium overdrives before. Uh, just 46 overdrives that take like a 4633 and turn it into a DX4 100 or whatever. And perhaps that would be more suitable for the Woodgrain 46, but I've got this one here, complete in box. It's been sitting in its sealed packaging for 25 years thereabouts. It was originally launched in uh, October 1995, maybe early 1996, depending on where you look. But back then it was 299 US dollars for just this upgrade chip. And that's the equivalent of around $500 adjusted for inflation. So a bit pricey for just a CPU upgrade to the point where they didn't last on the market for too very long. And there were a lot of critiques in the media about it just being like, who the heck is this thing for? Average consumers found it too costly and businesses would rather just get a new system. One IT guy was quoted as saying both a memory and hard disk upgrade made sense alongside a Pentium. So if you do one, you have to do all three. And if you end up doing all three, it's just cheaper to buy a new system. So yeah, I mean, all good points. I, I totally give all the points to their logic. <laughs> but man, Intel was pushing all the things it could do. I mean, look at all these software benchmarks, you know, 135%, 144%, 267% better in some programs. Oh, wow. Uh, need help in selecting which one you need? I mean, look at all these things that you can do on the website. And yeah, they had a website. You can go out on the web, the cyberspaces, and you can go and download this PDF. Seriously, I did. It's still on archive.org. Uh, yeah, the Intel Pentium Overdrive Processor Performance Report. It's 30 pages of like just benchmarks and how cool it is to to use this thing in your 46 and there's so much going on man i don't know i don't really i don't know man i just i just want to play duke nukem 3d and descent 2 and stuff but there were a lot of serious people looking at this and making paperwork <laughs> Anyway, uh, let's go ahead and get this unboxed because uh, I'm curious what's inside. Oh, the box itself is glued to itself. Mm. Actually, it looks like this one was made in 1998, February 13th. Wow, that's almost exactly 22 years ago for the day I'm recording this. Okay, maybe they were in the market a little bit longer than I've read. I'd read that kind of just lasted through 1997. 98 would have been pretty late to get an 83 megahertz Pentium. <laughs> I did not make that easy. Ooh, fresh Pentium overdrive. No Bachman Turner included. Look at that. Yeah, this is one of those, I believe the heatsink is permanently attached and there is a replaceable fan clip to the top, but uh, yeah, they were serious about the cooling on this thing. Uh, just as an example, my AMD 46 that's in there right now does not require any cooling at all. It's a 3.3 volt CPU, so it's never had a heat sink or fan or anything, but this, yeah, they're like, it's five volt, it runs hotter or whatever. You just gotta make sure it's nice and cool. Gotta wonder about the thermals in between the CPU and the heat sink, but we'll see. Uh, let's see here, what all we got? Oh man, so we've got a stay in the loop registration card. The beginning of a valuable relationship with Intel. Mm -hmm. Just what I've been looking for around Valentine's Day. And we have the, uh, well this is not something I was expecting. Overdrive processor demonstration and diagnostics. Okay. Hmm. We've got a little remover tool of some kind. Intriguing. And some paperwork. Uh, attention, Packard Bell Systems. <laughs> oh dear, what now? Serial numbers 450 and 470 require additional hardware. 
Okay. <laughs> We're not putting in any of those, but yeah, quick installation. I mean, yeah, pretty simple. Pretty, pretty simple. It's just a drop-in thing, man. Got some jumpers if we need. I guess a diagnostics disc to check things out. That's cool. I'm glad it comes with that. Let's see if the manual says what to do with this doohickey. <laughs> Oh, there's an animated demo. That's gonna be good. <laughs> I like animated demos. Okay, so that's what that's for. Removing the processor from a socket with no handle. I haven't seen one of those in a while. I don't know, 46 anyway. So yeah, that, uh, yeah, that makes sense. You got the little grooves there, fits between the pins. Dang, that's cool. Glad I have one of these. I've, I've had some trouble pulling things out of like a 36 before. <laughs> so uh, yeah, anyway, the rest of this just seems to be generic. Ah, we've got a data sheet. How nice. Although I've already looked up all this stuff online, but uh, yeah, check it out, man. This is something I'm pretty excited about. 16K of code cache and 16K of right back capable data cache. The AMD that I have in there right now is only 8K of L1 cache. Still no L2 on board. That is on the system board itself. I have 256K of L2 on that motherboard that we upgraded to in the past because <laughs> didn't have any L2 when we first did the build but uh yeah this should be quite the lovely thing oh that is fresh look at this thing it's just so clean so nice and check out that integrated fan heat sink cooler design man it is all clipped on there looks like the fan could come off but i mean that heat sink is pretty thoroughly attached and i like the fact that it looks like it gets the power straight through the pins there's no connector for like a fan to the motherboard or Molex or anything like that. This is exciting, man. Oh, dude. It's not gonna be a 46 anymore. It's gonna be the LGR Woodgrain Pentium. That's weird. Oh, I don't know if I like that. I didn't think about that. <laughs> well, anyway, this seems like a pretty clear upgrade on paper. Uh, will it be a hundred plus percent better like Intel claimed? There's only one way to find out. Now let us get this thing set up and try out some benchmarks and games and stuff. Alrighty, let's just get the old AMD one out of there. Well, <laughs> the new CPU is old as well, but you know what I mean. There we go. Oh, poor AMD. Still a good CPU. Maybe I'll go back to it at some point, but uh, not today. Alright, and our drop-in replacement. Okay, so I guess with socket 3, we don't have exposed pins, unpopulated pins around the edges. I think that might just be with socket two. You'd have like an extra row all the way around each four sides. Okay. Well, that's that part out of the way. Now it's time to get to everyone's favorite part about old computers, all the jumper settings. So there's quite a variety of different things that this particular motherboard supports, but what we're looking for here is this P24T. I believe that is the Pentium Overdrive code name or whatever. All right, so JP9. Should be on one and two. It is. GP10 should be two and three. Okay, that is that one. Now I gotta worry about all these. Okay, JP13 should be one and two. There's nothing on JP13. So we will just add a jumper down there. Yeah. There we go. JP23 needs to be on three, four. Five, six, and seven, eight. Okay, I think this is the last one. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna triple, quadruple check everything here according to my list, and uh, yeah, if everything checks out, we'll plug everything in, power it on, and see what happens. All right, everything's set up, ready to go, installed, whatever. We just gotta get this on here and see what that's about, but let's just power it on and see what happens. Hmm, sounds a little different. There's a CPU fan going. <laughs> Didn't have one before this. Thankfully, it's not too loud or grinding or anything. Hey, check it out. So P24T, 80 megahertz. Close enough. <laughs> we'll run a CPU check here in a second and see how that goes. All right, so yeah, Intel Pentium 83 Overdrive, 83 and a half megahertz, indeed. 
2.5 clock multiplier, bus speed, 33 megahertz, everything looks as it should. And yeah, the internal cache is probably not gonna do everything because I don't believe I have write through mode. So I may just have the 16 out of 32 possible K on the chip itself. It's only gonna be write through for the internal cache, which means we're not gonna get that full 60 or 32K, we have 16K of the cache on L1. L2 is right back, that's cool. Not game breaking, but worth noting, this motherboard isn't the most uh, powerful thing to pair with a Pentium. All right, so let's try top bench really quick because I want to. And also because when I ran it before, uh, back when we installed the external cache down there, 256K, we were getting around 190. Actually, it looked just like this here, because that's just what this is. <laughs> so around 190 points, you can see in the top left there is just running in real time. So if you run the benchmark in real time here, we should be, yes, it's a bit faster, 218. So equivalent-ish, but well, it's going back and forth. Pentium 75 clone thereabouts. Let's see what it is with turbo. Nice, okay, so turbo still cranks it down a good bit like a 386DX40. Not nearly as slow as it is with that 486, but we can disable like the external cache and other things if we really want to get super slow for playing certain older games. But yeah, around 218, 219. Not bad, not the biggest jump though. I was hoping to get around 240 or 50, but again, this motherboard just isn't the best thing for the time. Still an improvement nonetheless. I mean, it is working, right? So uh, here's something else. I've got another benchmark on here, this uh, 3D benchmark. Uh, let me show you what it was with the 4D6 that we had in here previously. This is more of a test of like VGA capabilities and whatnot, but you know, it should still be faster with a Pentium. So with the 4D6, we ended up getting a score of 47.1. We'll run it with the Pentium here and see what we get. Should certainly be faster. I I'm not expecting like a ton faster, because again, uh, we need to like upgrade the video card and whatnot to make more of an improvement to this, I believe. 55.7, okay. Just out of curiosity, I'm gonna run cache check here. And uh, well, I'll just have it check the cache. Ah, I'm curious about that L1, if it really is just giving us 16 of the 32. Ooh, got some results. So uh, yeah, only 16K of L1, but man, that's like two or something times the speed, maybe three times, just a lot faster than the uh, 46 one was, and plus it's got all sorts of floating point stuff and Pentium things. It is a clear improvement. So uh, let's just go ahead and try this overdrive processor demonstration and diagnostics disk. So there's a Windows version. Hmm, I don't want to do that. Oh, it's got a fan monitor. How cool is that in DOS? I, I like it anyway. <laughs> all right, install all the things, please. Listen to the sound of my disk. All right, so we got some demos. We got a fan monitor. Let's just see what that looks like. <laughs> it's on. <laughs> no RPMs, no anything. It's just on. Okay, let's try this. The actual program itself. Ooh, mm, got a mouse. Oh, what kind of weird resolution this is. It is uh, bowing on my monitor and I don't feel like fixing it. Let's see if this is any different. It's the same thing. Just says whether or not the fan is on. Review installation demonstration. Whoa. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. Man, the dithering. I am gonna capture this on the capture device for posterity really quick. Hold on. All right, let's start that over because it's worth it. Look how awesome that looks. I mean, I hope it looks good to you or else I'm just going crazy. You know, weird old man. <laughs> this, I, uh, I love these kind of little things. Look at those hands. Dude. Animations. <laughs> oh, those are phenomenal looking pixels on the motherboard in there, all the little details. Dude, somebody put some real serious time into this. Intel, man. They didn't hold out. Oh, look at that. Look at the little removal tool graphic. 
Oh, that is so cool. Oh, look at that. That's enough of that. If you want to see the rest of it, uh, you can see the download in the video description for the disc and take a look. Anyway, let's run the processor instruction test. Oh, man. Wow. I'm assuming that that is legit and it's not just running numbers in an animation. <laughs> All right. That's pretty cool. Floating point conformance test. Ah, oh, that's my kind of test right there. I love conforming to floating points. Doing some math. It's just, just calculating tons of things, man. The power of the Pentium. Look at it go. All right, well, that's, that's all for that. Uh, didn't really do a whole lot other than show me some really cool animations and some numbers that I am going to trust that were real. Right, let's run some games. I mean, we gotta try Duke 3D because it ran like total crap before this. I mean, it's probably still gonna run like crap to a degree, but uh, let's make sure everything's good. 320 by 200 normal mode. We're not even gonna mess with VESA compatibility. Um, but if you will see the footage here of how I was running on the 486 that we had before this, this is just the first level of the first episode. And you can see it hangs around 10 frames per second just at the beginning. And it goes much lower down to the single digits and whatnot throughout the rest of the level. And it's not great. This is, again, 320 by 200. And it's just kind of rolling along, chugging through the game. It's not a pleasant experience, mostly single digits. Well, now we're gonna try it on the Pentium and man, it's already loading much quicker. So that's good. Nice. Let's rock. Dang. <laughs> well, it is nominally better. We're getting low teens up there. So that's the frame rate, more or less, right now. Uh, you know. It's faster, but again, there's only so much we're going to be able to squeeze out of this system, considering the other things that are installed in there, like uh, the video card. It's certainly more playable, though. That's for absolute sure. Not as good as I could be, but I'll take it. Time to die. If I were spending the equivalent of 500 bucks on this back in the day for like games or whatever like this, uh, this would not be the most satisfying thing. There's other bottlenecks that I think are making much bigger of a difference in terms of games like Duke 3D. Um, let's try Descent 2, because that's another one that uh, just ran like total garbage on the 486. Uh, let me show you what that looked like. Here's some direct capture of Descent 2 on the 66 megahertz AMD CPU that I had in here before. And again, single digits, low teens, a little better than Duke 3D, but um, yeah, not great. Uh, even when cranking down the settings, oh, this, is, this is the highest settings here, but if we crank the detail all the way down to the lowest, it's, you know, a little better. You can get a few extra frames here and there. I mean, I would have played this when I was a kid. <laughs> it's just such a cool game that I wouldn't have cared, but uh, this is not great nowadays, that's for sure. And uh, low detail, mid and high detail, whatever, it's all pretty sucky. So, moving on over to the Pentium. Let us see how this goes. Looks better. Let's turn on the frame counter. So, okay, yeah. I mean, that's, again, pretty clear improvement. Ooh, much more playable. Not great. Still dipping into the single digits here and there, but not nearly as much. And again, this is on the highest uh, detail setting. So, that's a red door. What am I shooting for? Can't handle all the action. Let's see what it's like with the lowest again. Yeah, nominally better, you know, like it was in the 46, but... I mean, honestly, this is about how I played Descent 2 for the first time back in the day. It was on like a Pentium 90, I believe. So it's maybe a little quicker than this, but... <laughs> Oddly nostalgic in a way. 
which is really the whole point of this build. It's not to make the fastest 46 or early Pentium. I'm just, I'm experimenting with parts and seeing what things do, because now I can. <laughs> it's fun. All right, one more thing that I want to try here, and that is uh, Quake, because it didn't work whatsoever. But we're going to try a benchmark. Mm, the venerable Phil's Computer Lab benchmark. Shout out to Phil for these handy programs and things you can download on his website. So we're going to run the quick time demo, just the normal one. And again, this did not even run at all on the 486. I mean, it, it tried. Well, this doesn't either. Let's try one of the other ones. Lower resolution, I believe. Nope. Okay, clean boot here. Let's see if it does anything different. That totally doesn't want to work. <laughs> well, let's just try Doom. See if that does anything. Max details. <laughs> I didn't run this on the 46, so I don't really have anything to compare it to, but uh, certainly it looks like it's running a bit smoother than it did on that CPU, just looking at it. All right, 2134 game ticks, 2664 real ticks. Those are numbers. Again, I don't have anything to compare it to, unfortunately. Ah, oh, man, that sucks. I couldn't even get the Quake demo, time demo to work at all, man. <laughs> so, final thoughts on the Pentium Overdrive processor, 83 megahertz, for now, anyway. Um, it's unfortunate that it's uh, connected to such a <laughs> computer. You know, if it was a more capable machine, we would be getting more of the capabilities of it. You know, it, it's sort of a weird conundrum. I was reading about that in the reviews, in the contemporary reviews back in the day. People were like, just again questioning who exactly this is for because the faster your system is you know the better it is the more the newer it is the better capable your 46 board is the more you're going to get out of this the older it is the less you're going to get out of it and that's like backwards you know the people with the slower older systems don't get as much out of the upgrade as the people with the newer faster systems that are already newer and faster so <laughs> yeah I'd kind of much rather have a 486 DX4100 and stick that in here, or even maybe one of the AMD P75 or something you can overclock and do cool things. Maybe I'll try that in the future. And I also do want to try with messing around with different VLB compatible cards, like some different video cards and memory as well. I want to try maybe some faster memory because I think that would make a good difference, honestly, because I think that's a bit of a bottleneck. Anyway, all sorts of things to mess with on this 486 and <laughs> That's why I have it. It's just, yeah, screwing around with configurations and things that I never could back in the day. Wondered about them. I've always been curious if they've been any good ever since diving back into the hobby as an adult. And yeah, it's like, I don't know, it's just fun. I love messing around with these things. And I love Missile Command. And my camera battery just died, so I guess that's the end of the video. I mean, it, it pretty much was anyway. I was just wrapping up, so... Right, if you enjoyed seeing this, then do check out some of my others in the 486 Upgrades Updates series, or whatever else I post here each and every week on LGR. And as always, thank you very much for watching.